President Armacost, trustees, very distinguished members of the faculty, colleagues, graduating students, families, friends. As a child, I learned the virtues of gratitude. A person may be measured by his or her ability to appreciate words of friendship and moments of grace. Indifference alone can stifle gratitude, and as you know, indifference is the enemy of what endows life with beauty and mystery. And so, at the very outset, allow me to say thank you. Thank you, my dear colleagues and President Armacos, for allowing, first of all, me to be part of your celebration today. And above all, thank you for honoring my co-honoree, a very special person, a unique person in my life, a person who, to quote an old sage, a very old sage of the Jewish tradition, has actually been more than a part of whatever I tried to give and to share. He said, and I repeat his words, whatever I gave you, some of you, my readers or my students, whatever you received is not only from me, but from her too. And of course, I speak about Marion Wiesel, my wife. Now, in truth, I like commencements. I have taken part in many. I like commencements because I like to see justice done and hope fulfilled. I like to witness your accomplishments. I like to see the joy on your faces. I like to sense the hope that you personify. You are to me and to your teachers whom I have known, at least some of them, you are our hope for tomorrow. The century is about to end and you are now the bridge between this and the next. It is a legacy that we have given you and now it's up to you to do with it whatever you can to make it a better world and to make the human condition a more noble one. You have no idea what it means for a teacher to speak to you at this moment. You have no idea the anguish that fills our hearts because we believe that when we had the same opportunity, when we were your age, the world was much uglier and the heart emptier. Now what did we try to teach here at Eckert and at my school at Boston University or in my books as a writer and teacher. A few words, I think, are in order about this very special institution. It all began here in this hall. I came seven years ago invited by President Armacos to give a lecture and the topic that he gave me was the story of Job. Now, why Job? Why a story of suffering? Is it because he thought of the listeners who would suffer or about the lecturer who will suffer? I came and I think both suffered. And maybe that's why he called me back next year. Feeling there was so much suffering in the first lecture, let's see if something was left for the next. I came back a third year and so I have been here for seven years. In the meantime, it is true that I had some marvelous students, especially thanks to some of my colleagues whom I came to know in the Department of Religion, of Theology, of English, History, Philosophy, and especially a professor whom most of you know, Professor Kathleen Johnston, who actually was doing the teaching. I was there, her assistant. But then, 
I realized that so many of you are so good. It is a very good school. I had the opportunity and the privilege of teaching in many special places, but this one is very special. The, the compassion that you students have developed for each other, the sense of comradeship, of companionship that I've, I, I have felt coming from you is, was, and will remain for me a source of joy and gratitude. Now, what have you learned here? First of all, you have learned the importance and the passion of learning that we are all students. You think you finish with Plato and Shakespeare. You have not. They will pursue you. The only difference is, and will be, until now, they were there because you needed them. From now on, they will be there only when you will call them. They will be there not for grades, the grades you have, you are going to get your degree, and the only thing that separates you from your degree is my speech. <laughs> <laughs> Were I to be a little less compassionate with you as you have been with me, I could make it long. <laughs> the, bike, the backpiper left, and the president would not dare to interrupt me. <laughs> you may. So, but don't worry. I also practice what I teach. I will not be too long except to celebrate the virtues of learning, first of all. But remember, learning means to possess a sense of morality. Morality without learning is impossible, but learning without modality is dangerous. You think you can study space or marine biology, as I heard 90% of you wanted to study. Whatever you study, if it's not endowed with a component of ethics, of ethical concerns, it is then useless. We do not live in a world of abstraction. A human being is not an abstract notion. A human being is a universe in itself. A human being is alone, just as God is alone, and God alone is alone. But we, because we are in his image, we need each other, and we can do for each other in order to break through our loneliness. This is what you are learning. You are learning that Socrates, before he died, could have chosen exile, and yet he chose death. Why did he choose death over exile? You study religion and you study Moses. Why was Moses so solitary and so unhappy? Only because he was a leader, must all leaders be unhappy? You study whatever you have studied, and you must remember that if what you have studied is good for you alone, then it was worthless. It must be good for someone else. It is always the other that justifies your own existential concern and your existential commitment. What is good is what is good for you, not for me. If it were, if this were, the concern and the goal of our leaders in politics, our country would fare much better, and all the countries all over the world. But the problem is that when they were students, they must have been very good students. But something happened to them between school and Washington, there must have been something, I don't even know what. And these are no longer the same people. Let them be what they were. Curious, eager to share, eager to receive, and eager to help one another. Now, our society, as you know, is not an ideal society, nor can it be. Utopia is gone, never was. We live in a strange world. Everything is strange about it. You read, let's say, the new newspaper, you will see half of the bestseller list, and this is something I must read occasionally, half of the list is about dieting, and the other one is about cooking. <laughs> now make up your mind. 
you buy new blue jeans and make holes in them. You go to places and you pay money, expensive places, you pay money for not eating. Now, we go to space and we know so much now about space, but we don't know enough about our neighbor's heart. What have we forgotten? We have forgotten that our neighbor is as human as I am, as you are. Our century, the one that is just about to leave, has been a violent one, cruel in many ways. Two world wars, two totalitarian ideologies that brought about maledictions on the human condition and the human being. We have learned in this century by assassination. It began in Sarajevo, where the crown prince was killed and it unleashed the First World War, and it didn't stop. It went on and on. Fifty years ago or so, it was the assassination of Gandhi, the man of peace. And then the assassination of John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Yitzhak Rabin and Sadat. So many people, men and women, who wanted peace and became victims of violence. Are we learning from them, from the killers, how to live in a society? Is this what we want? We must become each other's teachers, each other's guides, each other's friends, each other's allies in seeking a better world, a different world. And that world is here, 18 months from now. And it's for you to shape its face and its destiny. It's for you to do what others have not done, to bring more humanity into history, to humanize destiny. And so, my good friends, as you are about to become graduates of this very marvelous special college, remember that the work is not finished. A very great master, my tradition, a Hasidic master, was asked once by a student of his, he said, God created the world in six days, and look how ugly it is. Look how cruel it is, how inhuman it is. And the master said to him, could you do better? And the student who was totally forlorn said, yes. And the master said, so what are you waiting for? Get busy. That is, I think, the lesson for you. Don't wait. Start working. We all need you. Thank you.